Hello, I'm Jerry Tashwa. I'm the chairman of the pedagogy committee for the Vibraphone Project. The Vibraphone Project was organized to celebrate the 100-year anniversary of the Vibraphone. The pedagogy committee will be presenting clinics and information about the Vibraphone every other month beginning with this month. During this pandemic, everything we do will be virtual. So there's a bit of a challenge in making sure that the technology comes together and everything works out. And again, this is our very first one, so hopefully this will be a, a good test for us and it'll work out just fine. After this 30-minute clinic, uh, we hope to open it up for questions. Again, we're not sure if this technology is gonna allow us to do it or not, but we shall see. Anyway, let's get started talking about the vibraphone. So when somebody sees a vibraphone, they quickly notice there's a few differences. First of all, the keyboard itself is on one plane. In other words, the sharps and flats that are usually elevated on a marimba or a xylophone and they overlap are on one plane and they're flat. And this creates a little bit of a challenge, and I was aware of that when I first started out as well, that the distance to the notes seemed to be a little further just because of that the, the fact that they're not overlapping. The next thing you notice about the vibraphone, obviously, is it has metal bars. Metal bars, as you know, if you strike a metal object, it tends to vibrate and ring and can produce then unusual sounds and things that you're not aware of uh, and that you have to deal with. So that's the second thing. The third thing is obviously the vibraphone has a pedal. So these three things are primarily the differences in the two instruments, but we have to use these three things to control the vibraphone. Now, as you know, that if, if you push the pedal down and the notes start to ring, that the distance is created between half steps, seconds, uh, major sevenths, flat nine intervals can be very harsh and very hard to listen to, something that you, you totally want to avoid. So we have to then find a way to control these vibrations and these frequencies to make the instrument sound good. Now, I want to step back before I get into this, actually, the techniques. I want to talk a little bit about, real quickly, grips. I'm not going to go into detail about grips because I know that this is a personal thing, that everybody needs to find a grip that works for them, that fits their hands, that they're comfortable with. I get a lot of people coming to me uh, that want to study with me, and they want to sound like me. So right away, they change to my grip, which is one of the various uh, cross grips. I use this one. And so they want to like automatically just go to this grip to play vibraphone. So here's what I did. When I first started out, I started out on a marimba. I experimented with one of the marimba grips, the non-crossed grips. I experimented with those for a little while, and they look kind of like this. And then I also got into the cross grip, and I went back and forth. When I got into the vibraphone, I saw that everybody was using, again, a cross grip. So I figured, well, this is what you got to do. So I started using a cross grip on the vibraphone. Then when I went to the marimba, I used one of the various marimba grips. And I real quickly found out that there's not enough time in the day to develop two grips. At least there wasn't for me. Two grips require special muscles and different fingers. They require a lot of calluses, and you have to develop these calluses. Otherwise, when you do a performance, immediately you get a blister, and it hurts, and then you can't play, and it bleeds, and it's a real hassle. So you've got to develop calluses. And there's just not enough meat on my hands and skin to get all the different calluses necessary to, to come up with two grips and to maintain two grips. So I had to find a grip that worked for me. Now, I'm, I'm predominantly a vibraphone player now, who also plays marimba. Because of that, I use this grip, which is the cross grip. I use this all the time. When I go over to marimba, yes, there's some things that are maybe a little more challenging for me to do, uh, like just kind of rolling the, the notes, getting a nice rolling chord sound is a little bit of a challenge, and I have to work at that. Um, when I come over to the vibraphone, I have, I have equal power at any given mallet in any time, which is real important because when I start to get into the dampening techniques, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, having the ability to have any mallet do the dampening at any time is very, very, very important to me. So that's basically all I want to talk about grips. Now, whatever grip you decide to do, 
you're going to have to make a compromise depending on which instrument you go to. Um, again, I have kids come to me that have like worked years and years and years on developing their marimba grip and they come over here and they want to change. And I say, you know, you, you spend so much time on that grip. Why don't you continue with that grip and, and see if you could make it work for you? Find out a way to, to do whatever you need to do to do the dampening and make it sound good and see if, you know, you can, before you make the change, see if you can make it work for you. And again, I'm sure they, they really appreciate that because there's, there's a lot of time invested in this kind of thing. And, and you want to make sure that it fits your hands and feels comfortable and, and again, my thing is I couldn't maintain two grips. I had to find one that worked. Now, let's talk about these techniques. The five techniques that I have narrowed it down to make this instrument articulate and clean um, are in my method book. The method book is called a Contemporary Mallet Method. It's an approach for the vibraphone and marimba. And I go through the, the, each one of the techniques and I narrowed it down to five and we'll talk about them right now. The first one is for Melodic type scale passages, notes that are fairly close together. So what you're going to do is I'm going to hold the pedal down so it's theoretically everything should be ringing. And I'm going to play a scale. And as I'm playing a scale, I'll be playing it with my right hand going up. Okay? And then my, my left hand is just going to basically follow the right hand and just stay in the center of the bars and put pressure on the bar as it's moving up to dampen the, the vibrating bar. So let's just start here, F scale. And then when I come down, reverse it. So that's called slide dampening. And again, that's pretty much for melodic type scale-ish passages where the notes are fairly close together, you can use that technique. The second technique that I talk about I call uh, touch tone. And this is kind of a complicated technique. It'll take you a little while to feel comfortable with this one. And here it goes. So my, my left mallet will hit a note. I'm going to hit the D. And at the same time, I hit the D, I'm going to hit another note, and then my first mallet that I hit the D with will dampen the D at the same time I hit another note. So here is the D. As I hit another note, the first mallet will dampen the D. Again, this technique is primarily for intervals, intervallic leaps, where you're leaping somewhere and you want that note to ring until you hit the next note. So here you go again. One mallet will hit the note. I'll hit another note. The first one got dampened. That one got dampened. And again, you notice that I'm using four mallets. We'll talk about this in a minute, and, uh, but my four mallets all have the ability to do all of these dampening exercises, and it's real important to do it that way. Okay, moving along. The next technique is what I call adjacent note, and this one's fairly simple. So I'm going to hit a D, and then I'm going to go and hit the C right next to it, and as I hit the C, I'm going to just move over and dampen the D. So here's the D. As I hit the C, okay, fairly easy technique. You want to try to stay in the center bars. The center bars is where the bars are vibrating the most and it's the easiest part to actually dampen because you're controlling it right there in the center, just staying there in the center. And again, in one motion, you're just going over and you're dampening the first note as you hit the second note. So that's the three techniques. And, and I want to emphasize that these techniques, 
they need to be subconscious. They need to be so comfortable in your arsenal of, of technique that you don't even think about it. It's like walking. You don't really think about walking. You just, you want to get over there, you walk there. Same way with this. As you're playing the first notes you want to let ring, then you have to go ahead and dampen other notes while that note is ringing. Or if you hit a chord and you want to play a melody, then you have to dampen the melody while the chord is ringing. So you have to be sensitive to what you want to ring and what you want to dampen and which technique will be required to dampen it. And the more you practice this stuff, the more it becomes second nature and it just automatically happens and there's not a real big deal. So the, uh, the fourth technique is hand dampening. And hand dampening for me is predominantly a right-handed technique where I'm going to hit a G and then I'm going to go down and hit the G flat and then the meaty part of my, my pinky finger will essentially dampen the G as I come down. I'm just making contact with the bar as I hit the next note. Okay? And that's, that's kind of nice. So this allows you to do things like... Okay, it's kind of like a little way of introducing another tone after you hit something. Uh, so that's hand dampening. The final technique is the pedal. Pedal has two functions. The first function of the pedal, obviously, is to clear the harmony. So you play a chord. If you're going to play another chord, you pedal, hit the other chord, and here it is. So just, just again, clearing the harmony. Okay, that's what the pedal does, just clears out the harmony. Now, there's another pedal technique, and I call it flutter pedaling. And flutter pedaling, well, let me say, if you, if you didn't pedal, if you left the pedal up, and if you played notes, very staccato and very dry. If that's the effect that you want, then by all means, there, go for it. But usually in music, you want the notes to have some air around them. You want them to be a little bit alive, and you want to have a little bit of ringing. So what you do with the flutter pedaling is I'm going to push down on the pedal, and I'm going to get to the point where the note just starts to ring. And I'm going to kind of memorize that with my foot. So again, I'm pushing down on the pedal just till it starts to ring, Memorize that spot, and then I'm basically going to take my foot and move the dampener bar up and down off of the bars at the rate at which I'm playing to allow a little bit of air to circulate around the notes and a little bit of ringing, but not enough ringing that it gets offensive. So here's an example. I'm pushing down on a pedal. So you can hear right there, the notes just start. So I memorize that spot with my foot, and then And that's flutter pedaling. So that covers all the basic dampening techniques 
that you need to know. And again, you need to know these inside and out, subconsciously, and just be able so that you can play a melody, play a tune, and things are in control, nothing is ringing. Now, you can generally tell a bad vibes player who needs to work on his dampening by if you're sitting there listening and, and things are vibrating, the, the paintings on the wall going zzz, and you have a glass of water in front of you, and maybe white caps are jumping out of the water. This is obviously a good indication that things are out of control, and vibes can be a very annoying instrument. Half steps, seconds, major sevens, flat. These intervals are harsh anyway to begin with, but when you put the transients and the vibrations of these aluminum bars, it, it just it's enough to sterilize you. So you want to try to make sure you can maintain control of your instrument, and these five techniques are what you have to do to do that. So. We talked about slide dampening, number one. We talked about touch tone, the intervallic thing. We talked about adjacent note, where you take a note and you just slide down while you hit the second note to dampen the first note. We talked about hand dampening, where I'm using my right hand to basically allow me to go pretty much down half, down, up or down half steps to introduce another note and then obviously the pedal. So these five techniques are what are required uh, to play this instrument, and it makes it different than a marimba. Now, a lot of students, a lot of percussionists that come to mallet instruments, the vibraphone is, is like the elephant in the room. It's the one that's like, yeah, I'll get to that later. Uh, that's, there's a lot involved with the vibraphone. I've got to learn. I've got to learn to play all this dampening stuff, and then I've got to learn the reaches are a little bit different, and, and I'm not, I'll get to that later. So they, they go to the marimba, and the marimba is just, just easier to execute technically. I mean, obviously, there's got its challenges as well. But let's face it, if you want to sustain something on the marimba, you have to physically roll. I mean, if you, if you hit a marimba, it pretty much goes thunk, right? You hit a vibe, and with the pedal down, it, it could like ring for a long time, and you definitely have to control that ringing for a long time uh, so that it doesn't interfere with other things and create nasty dissonances that offend you. So these kind of things are what's always happening as a vibraphone player is playing. Uh, you see a lot of vibraphone players who play maybe more like a, like a saxophone. In other words, they take two mallets and they play melodic lines linear, singular notes, some melodic lines, and a lot of them don't use a lot of the dampening. They may just kind of pedal a lot or not even really deal with the pedal that much, just play really fast and it kind of, kind of sounds decent. But if you're going to get into more contemporary playing where you're involved with uh, harmony and also executing different melodies, the dampening thing is a vital thing that you have to deal with. Now, I do want to talk about the use of four mallets. I started out as a drummer, came to the mallet instruments, uh, and again, put a stick in each hand. So my teacher gave me two mallets, one in each hand, and he taught me my scales. I played my scales, got real good at it, arpeggios, got real good at it. And I thought, this is great. I can do this. You know, it's coming right from, from snare drum, I mean, match grip snare drum, and I'm playing like crazy. Then one day, he brought in a piece of music, and it had three notes at the same time. And I said, well, how do I do that? So my teacher said, this is a guy up in Pittsburgh, his name was Babe Fabrizi. He told me, okay, well look, we're going to pick up another mallet in your left hand. I said, two mallets in one hand? Yeah, two mallets, put that in there, okay. And he said, now play your chords this way that you see written on the music. And when I picked up the mallets, I mean, immediately it's like, you know, it felt weird. I couldn't control it. My fingers weren't working properly. It was a challenge. So a couple weeks later, you know, I started feeling like, okay, I, I can do this. The two mallets and one in my right hand, that, was, that sort of worked. And I got pretty good at it. And then one day I went in for a lesson. He pulled out another piece of music, and this time it had four notes on it. And I'm going, uh-oh, okay, so now I guess we pick up another mallet, right? Yep, you guessed it, pick up another mallet. So then I got another mallet in my right hand. Then it's like awkward again, and, and I'm like not sure which mallet and, and the distances and the reaches and the intervals. And it just felt clumsy, right? So weeks went by, and now all of a sudden, now it's making sense. So here's what I discovered. 
I watched my wife who teaches piano. And when she gets students that come in, from day one, it's 10 fingers on 88 notes, day one. They don't spend six months developing a thumb and an index finger and, okay, I think you're ready, let's add another finger. You know, I, I don't think they do that. It's, it's pretty much day one. This is the contemporary way of playing. This is what's expected. This is the technique. This is the fingering. This is the piano. Go for it. So my approach now to vibraphone is, is pretty much the same way. I, I have students. I only really had a couple beginner students ever. But what I do, when they walk in, I immediately, whether they've touched an instrument or not, I put four mallets in their hand for the simple reason that this is the contemporary way of playing. You're expected at one point in your life, if you're going to be a, a mallet percussionist, that you're going to have to play chords or four mallet anything. So you might as well learn from day one. So I get a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, you're toting around like four mallets. What if you just have a single line, two mallet kind of thing? Why would you want to like go through the trouble of hanging on to two more mallets? And I, and I have an answer for that. The answer is I can get to things cleaner and faster as a four mallet player than two mallet players can for the simple reason that if I just open up my mallets and stand over the keyboard, I immediately have four notes available to me at the drop of my mallet, right? Which means that up or down the half step, I have four more notes and I can just kind of go back and, you know, back and forth with, between my hands playing all those notes and it just like opens up the keyboard to me in terms of availability with very little motion. And I found out the key to pretty much all of percussion is if you can reduce motion, the, the ability to move your arms to get to something, to hit something, if you can reduce that motion you'll play faster, cleaner and more accurate with less likelihood of a wrong note. Now arpeggios, if you want a big huge arpeggio. You may try that with two mallets. You know, if you try that with two mallets, I mean, you got, you, you got all that motion. And, and there's a good chance, like I just did, of missing a note because the momentum of your hand, you have to control the distances and the speed to get there and the weight of the hand. But with four mallets, you know, it's just flicking the wrist. So I carry four mallets all the time, everything. When I'm playing xylophone parts, four mallets. When I play marimba, four mallets. When I play little glockenspiel, those little you know, brass uh, mallets that you use, four of them. And it just works for me. I can just play anything fast, clean, and accurately. Now, there are times when I only be playing a single line. In that case, you know, I started out, um, again, when I was younger, my, my approach was coming from a match gripping snare drum technique that when I held four mallets, that the two inside mallets looked like match grip snare drumming to me. So what I did then, I would take my melodies that I wanted to play with single, you know, just with, with two mallets, with single lines. And I played it with those two inside mallets. So when I went to Berkeley and I'm studying, and I was studying with Gary Burton, Gary does something a little bit different. He uses his, his uh, number three mallet and his top number one mallet is his predominant single lines when he's playing like, like a two mallet player or you know, melodic melodies that are just required to be singular. And I asked him, I said, so why, do you, why would you do that? It, that didn't make sense to me when this is like kind of more natural coming from the drumming world. And his answer, and it kind of makes sense, is most of the melodies occur up in this range. So his number one mallet then would play most of those melodies. Of course, his left hand would come up and assist occasionally. But when he's playing that with his upper mallet, his number one mallet, then it left all the other three mallets available to play chords or support lines or to support his, uh, his melody that he has up here. So again, it's, it's a personal thing. So what happened with me is I learned this way. When I studied with Gary, I added that. So for me, I've got like more independence, I guess, than the average guy, just because 
I learned one way and then I, I learned his way as well. And it just kind of works for me. It opens it up. I can play anything just real quickly with the use of my independence. Again, keeping in mind dampening. This is an instrument that rings. This is an instrument that if it rings terribly and half steps and major sevens and flat nine, it can be a god-awful ugly instrument to listen to. So we need to perfect that. That's the primary thing that all mallet players need to do when they get to this instrument. First off is work on your dampening, get it subconscious, and then get into the different things and depending on whether you want to uh, study with me and the way I play and with four mallets or if you want to be a two mallet player. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying this is the technique that I use and how I do it. Now, so we're going to talk about playing chords. Percussionists come to the vibraphone and are, are somewhat challenged by the concept of, of playing chords. You know, we, we take a C major chord, the first chord that we all learn as percussionists. We come over to the instrument and we play it this way, C, E, G, B. Root position, second and third, smaller than an octave, that's the chord that we know. I mean, it's a fine chord, it works, it is a C major 7 chord. However, if you're playing a melody up here or something, all of a sudden you need a C major 7 chord. If that's the only one you know in that position, you come down here and you have to play your C major 7 chord, and you go back up. So you're, you're jumping around because that's the only position of that chord you know. We need to correct that, and I'm going to give you this real quick, easy way of taking your chords and expanding them. And when you expand a chord on the instrument, the chord gets bigger. It sounds fuller. It allows us then to compete with piano players and guitarists and just have a, a nice sound. So let's take the C major 7 chord. Here's, the, here's what it sounds like. All right, what we're going to do, very simple, is we're going to exchange places with the outside two mallets. The root that's on the bottom, we're going to put it on top. The B that was on the top, we're going to put it on the bottom. So we take the same chord, expand it, You can hear it gets a little bit thicker in terms of texture. Now, the problem with this chord, and it doesn't really uh, create a problem on the vibraphone or the piano or an organ or any instrument that has uh, really good intonation, but the problem is if is the outside two intervals, the outside two interval of this chord is a flat nine, which can be a horrible interval in music, something that you try to avoid unless it's a, it's a powerful statement that you, where you want to use it. But in this chord, when it blends with the C major 7, it just, it just works. I mean, yeah, it's a rich chord. Okay, so now if you didn't want that much richness, and, and again, the reason I talk about, I'm sorry, let me backtrack, is that if you would write this chord for, like, say, four trumpet players where they have to deal with intonation, the problem would be that the outside two instruments, the guy playing the B and the guy playing the C, would have intonation issues. The guy playing the B would hear the guy playing the C creating a flat nine. So he would want to be going sharp. The guy playing the C would be hearing that B going on and that flat nine interval, and he'd want to like leak flat. So they, they have a hard time keeping that chord in tune. Now, if this bothered you, if you didn't want to have a chord with with that much dissonance in it, then what you can do is start doing substitutions. And this is where we get into a little bit more of the theory of, of jazz and music in general. But real simply, we're going to apply a tension. A tension are the upper structures of chords. And in this case, I'm going to put a substitute for the C that's on top. Here's the original chord. Here's the C on top. And I'm going to get rid of that C because I don't want that flat 9 interval. I don't want that to be there. So I'm going to substitute tension 9 for the root. So the root is now up here. Here's your tension 9. So again, I'm going bigger than an octave. First chord, expanding, substitute tension 9. 
So each time you can hear the chord just open up and get thicker. Now when you start opening up chords like this, instead of playing everything in close root position, when you have chords open, it allows you to do voice leadings a little bit easier because you have more room to manipulate and make your chords just kind of melt from one chord to another. Here's an example. Okay, just did a series of chords, blending, resolving into each other, and you saw I didn't have a lot of motion. Now, if you were playing everything in root position, yeah, you'd be bouncing around doing crazy things that wouldn't make a lot of sense. But by opening up chords, it gives you the ability to then move around a little bit and have more room to manipulate the mallets and to get to the next chord. Tensions, again, tensions are not rock and science as well. Very simple, and I'm going to give you in my book, I elaborate more on, on tensions and the proper tension for certain chords. There, there's all kinds of variations. You have natural tensions, you have chromatically altered tensions, you have uh, natural nine, you have a flat nine, flat 13, flat, you know, all these different kind of things. So you have to know which tension goes with which chord in which situation. But real quickly, Generally, and I say generally because again, it doesn't apply to everything, but generally a tension is a whole step up of each chord tone. So if we take a C major 7, a whole step above the root is D. So that's your tension 9. We'll put that up here. A whole step above the third, this E, is an F sharp. So here's your tension sharp 11. Whole step above the fifth is an A, that's your tension 13. So we have C major 7, 9, sharp 11, and 13. These are natural tensions that occur on a C major chord. And I don't really want to go into too much theory at this point, but I want to just kind of touch on it so you can see that other than just chord tones, there are notes that you can play that get rid of problems, like that flat 9 problem. If I didn't really want that, I could substitute a tension for a chord tone to get, get rid of the flat nine, but yet make the chord very effective and very full. These are the things that you have to do to play the vibraphone. Again, dampening, dampening, dampening. You've got to learn dampening. You've got to get good at dampening. You have to just breathe it for a while and live with it until you get to the point where you dampen and you don't really think about it, but it's just working. And then later on, you'll get into all the aspects of, of playing and sticking and whether you decide to be a four mallet player or a two mallet player, it's up to you. Which group you use, again, up to you, your personal taste and how you want to uh, you know, develop it. Uh, and then the chord possibility. I mean, so you, you can play chords, you can harmonize, you can support other players, singers, uh, soloists, and you can also accompany yourself by playing a melody and then just kind of filling it in with other chords and, and scales and improvising. So this is all I want to do really today in terms of this very short first clinic. We'd like to open it up for questions at this point, so hopefully this will work. Uh, anyway, uh, if you have some questions, go ahead, write them in, and we'll talk about it at this point. So thank you so much. Well, hello. I'm assuming that this is working. Um, I do have a few questions, and the way this is shaping up is I have people on the other end who are getting the questions, I guess, direct off of uh, YouTube and uh, are sending it to me on the phone, and I'm going to get into it with you. So the first question someone was asking, how would you suggest playing chords that may have awkward hand positioning? For example, playing chords like B flat major or B major. And yeah, I do have an answer for that. I'm assuming that you're meaning like playing a chord, uh, like a B major, let's talk about B major chord in root position where you have a B, a D sharp, an F sharp, and a, and a B. So basically you have to do kind of an awkward movement where you have to like squeeze your elbows in tight to be able to get to that kind of a chord. Uh, what I also found out is if you keep your inside mallets about a half of a head longer, which is what I do all the time, that when you get to those awkward chords, the fact that they're longer means you don't have to like cram your elbows in so tight that, to get it. So just kind of keeping that little bit, you know, half a head longer 
seems to do on chords I get. And remember, there's there's chords and there's all kinds of variations of chords. Uh, there, you know, there's different positions, different tensions you could add to kind of help you when you do have a chord that is in, in a very awkward position. So hopefully that helps you out. Okay, second question. What were some significant tips or advice that Gary Burton gave you when you studied with him? And right now, I mean, I, I can't recall any specific uh, advice other than when I got when I got together with him, it was always kind of it was a fun time that he would sit at the piano and he would assign a tune and I would come in and I'd play it on vibes. I'd improvise, he would improvise, I would comp behind him. Uh, and it was kind of fun to be able to do that. Uh, and then he would critique my my development, my my chord choices, my chord scale. He would critique them, and uh, we, we would just talk about it. But I, I do remember one thing that Gary said to me, and this kind of shocked me. He said, the better you get and the more successful you get in your career, the less you will work. And... and that shocked me because I'm thinking, well, the better you get, the more in demand you are, the more you're going to work. And he said, yeah, but at one point, he says, you're not going to be doing weddings and bar mitzvahs and local Joe's bar and grill. You're going to be playing better concerts and events. So you'll, you'll have better gigs, but you won't play as many of the dumb gigs, I guess is what he was saying. So, uh, and, and I found that to be fairly true, that um, the work that I seem to be doing now is a lot better than when I first graduated Berkeley and I was pretty much taking anything to, to make some money. Uh, so we, we tend to do pretty much major concerts right now. A lot of college dates where we'll do concerts in a clinic maybe in the afternoon, uh, the jazz festivals in Europe and, and things like that. And I, and I do get a lot of recording sessions, which is really nice, helps out too. Uh, third question, what are your top top five vibe solos that would be good for a beginner to transcribe. Okay, so my thinking on transcribing, again, comes probably from my, my relationship with Gary Burton and also from studying at Berkeley. There's kind of two schools of improvisation. There's, there's what I call the lick approach, where you learn licks. You learn like these licks and you start applying them on various different tunes all over the place. Berkeley teaches you a more of a look at the composition, hear the composition, analyze the melody, analyze the chords, know what scales, what chord scales go with every one of the chords, and then create improvisations from your heart, from your passion, from your ability to understand harmony and, to, and so I never really got into taking somebody else's solo I mean I've got the ears to hear it I can play like anybody if I wanted to but to actually sit down and transcribe like a Chick Corea solo or somebody else I never found the time or the need to do that because I don't want to then be sounding like Chick Corea I want to sound like Jerry Tashwa as a matter of fact we did a concert one time and uh, this is when I was at school, somebody came up to me and said, man, you guys are terrific. You sound exactly like the Gary Burton band. And I knew he meant it as a compliment, but I, I thought for a minute, I said, you know, you're, you're right. So I quit at that point listening to vibes players. I didn't want to sound like any other vibes player. I started listening to piano players. I listened to Bill Evans, piano player, uh, Keith Jarrett, Chick Corea, and God bless him, he just passed away a few weeks ago. I, I miss him so much. Um, but I started listening to what they were doing, what their left hands were doing. They, they were playing like chords and bass lines and then how their right hand kind of would weave around on improvisations and melodies. And that's how I got my style of playing. Again, I, I, I tuned out vibes players. I didn't want to have anything to do with the vibes world and I wanted to have my own identity. And, and I think I got that. Uh, Anyway, let's, let's move ahead here. And I'm sorry if I, I seem vague, but I'm, I'm just trying to cover some of these real quickly. So the fourth question is, what are your thoughts on tuning? Do you think there is a significant difference between 440 and 442? Boy, I don't know who brought this question up, but this is a sore subject with me. <sighs> okay, first of all, 440. If you live in the United States, everything is tuned. Pianos, synthesizers, orca, everything is tuned to 440. 
several years ago, I remember exclusively, and I'm not going to say the name of the person, but they muster instruments started tuning to 442. And I remember going to somebody says, why would you do that? And the comment that they said was, well, Yamaha is doing it, so we probably need to be consistent and, and do the same thing. And I'm going, no, we live in the United States where 440 is the standard tuning. Yes, in Europe, maybe they do tune to 442, but in the United States, 440s are some, and I have two sets of bars. I have a 440 and a 442, depending on where I'm going, and, and I'll use different bars. But my wife has perfect pitch, and everybody knows what perfect pitch is. Uh, so anyway, one day, I took another instrument, and the instrument was tuned to 442. And I, I just got this instrument. It was one of my students. It was an extended range instrument. And I remember taking it to this gig, and my wife was struggling. And I remember we took a break, and I said to her, I says, what's going on? I've never heard you play like this. You're, you're, like, you're like making mistakes that I never heard before. And she said, I hear you playing, and you're playing in the cracks. I can't discern where your pitch is and what you're trying to lead me into there's something going on. And I told her, I said, well, this instrument's tuned to 442. And just those two cents difference was enough to confuse her. So yes, 440 and 442 are significant. And if you ever hear two instruments together that are tuned, one 440, one 442, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's definitely drive you crazy. It's like, you know, cat scratching on the glass or something. Yeah. So you, you don't want to have it. I, I'm like on this campaign that you know, let's get back to tuning the instrument to what it should be and forget about all this. Like, well, I want the instrument to be a little brighter. I don't want the vibes to be any brighter. As a matter of fact, when I go into record, I intentionally go to the high end of the instrument with the EQ and I pull it down a little bit because I hate that bright, make your ears bleed, transients popping, distorted, high frequency, metally sound. And I hate that. And I hate bar, I mean, sorry, mallets that are real hard. I, I like a mallet that's soft and you can hear the fundamental of the note and they really make the instrument, you know, sweet and sound good as opposed to really hitting it with a with a hard mallet, which is one of the reasons I really didn't listen to any Lionel Hampton because at that time, the recordings, first of all, weren't that good, uh, just the way that technology hadn't evolved and he used really abrasive mallets. And it's just that clunky clunk sound is something I just, if, if that was the instrument that I had to play forever, I think I would have definitely quit a long time ago and been a piano player. So 440 and 442, great question. And I hope I didn't <laughs> go off on a tangent, but man, I, I really have strong feelings about that. Uh, fifth question, how do you plan or structure an improv section during a tune? Okay, so this, this is a, it's kind of a loaded question. So you, you, you look at the tune. If, if you know the tune, great. If you don't know the tune, you know, you're looking at the tune, you're analyzing, you're looking at the melody, what key is it in, how fast is it, you're analyzing the melodies, um, you, you're do, going through that kind of thing. And then you got to look at the harmony, you got to like real quickly, spontaneously look at the harmony. This is a Dorian scale, this is a Mixolydian, this is the Aeolian, this is anything weird coming up. So after you kind of get all that information in your head, when it's your turn to solo, it's a matter then of just relaxing and trusting your instinct and playing in the style of the tune. The reason you play the tune is to set up the groove for the improvisation. In other words, if you're playing a nice swing tune, a nice Stella by Starlight or something, da da ba da ba real nice and sweet, right? Swinging. And you know, you don't take off and go into a Latin or a polka or something. You know, you, you keep it within the, the, the framework of the tune. You, you try to, to, to do that. And anyway, you, you want to structure improvisation just to make sure things sound good, making sure that your distances are resolving properly. Um, think of it as a conversation. You, you want to kind of start easy. You're developing your idea. Your idea, you're getting more aggressive. You're increasing tessitura. You're getting more powerful. This is your climactic moment of your solo. And then you kind of like come down a little bit, resolve a little bit, and just kind of take it easy, and you're finished soloing the next soloist. It's sort of like a composition. You want to do the same thing when you compose music. You want to build up to some kind of a high climactic moment and then, then taper off. So that's pretty much the way I think about it in terms of improvisation. Again, I, I never 
learned licks. I wanted to be from that, that school that I studied at Berkeley where you're using your heart and instinct and mind and ears to develop your improvisation based off of your harmonic ability, your, your analysis of the music, uh, your technique, uh, and, and who you're playing with and how everything sounds. So it's, it's just something you, you work on. You, you have to really work at it. Okay, sixth question. Do you re recommend any exercises for getting more comfortable with adding musical tension and dissonances while you are playing? Okay, um, I, I, don't, I don't have any exercises except I could say that there was a class that I took at Berkeley and it was ta taught by Herb Pomeroy. And it was actually a big band class. And I was reluctant to take it because I really wasn't into big band. I'm into smaller ensembles. But everybody said, oh, no, Jerry, you're this is the class. This is why you go to Berkeley. It's called line writing. And Herb teaches this concept of developing not only uh, in solos, but just melodies in general and orchestrating in such a way that you start out with chords that are like very open and non-conflicting, which means each interval is basically not creating dissonance within itself, okay? And then you build up. So you target an area, which he calls a prime dissonance. This is what I decided in this composition is the prime climactic moment. And I assign that a number of prime dissonance. Let's say three prime dissonances, okay? And that's gonna be a powerful chord. Prime dissonances are half steps, major sevens, and flat nine intervals. So you're trying to then take these instruments, say it's like a saxophone and, and trumpets, and you're trying to then get all these notes where the interval relationships will create those half steps and major sevens and, and, and create power. And so the, as you build up into this chord, up into this climactic moment, you've got three prime distances at the climactic moment. Everything before it, does not exceed three prime distance. You could have two prime distances or one prime distance, but once you hit that, that's your climactic moment, and then as you're coming away from it, going to the end of the, the composition or the solo, or whatever, the same thing, two prime distance, one prime distance, there's no prime distance, and it allows it to grow. Now, an example of, of something that I may do a lot is a chord D minor seven flat five. So it's take D, F, a flat and C, just at root position, keeping it simple. D, F, A flat, and C. So it's a D minor seven flat five. Well, that's stacked in thirds, uneventful. So what I will do is I'll get rid of the third, the F, and I'll move it over and I'll play the G, which creates a G and an A flat. That's a prime dissonance within that chord. So that chord immediately becomes more powerful because it has that prime dissonance in it. So the chord now is D, G, A flat, that's that half step, to C. And I do things like that all the time, that I'm looking for areas to create dissonances within a chord voicing to make it more, you know, to make it fuller. Uh, okay, let's see. I've um, uh, got other questions here. Number seven, uh, and uh, this will probably be the last one, okay. What's the best way to play chords with notes that are close together? Example, C, D, F sharp, and A, stacked from low to high. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the question means other than, I mean, if I'm holding my mallet, so this would be a C and a D, and here's an F sharp and an A. I mean, I, I would just, uh, it's to me, it would not be complicated at all, but Again, that's a very close position chord. And when you have close position chords, like usually you use those for rhythmical punch because they don't have a big tonal volume around them. They're, they're very tight and small. So you can use them for like rhythmical things. But if you really want a chord to sound good, you take it and open it up. So you put like maybe the C, maybe the F sharp, maybe the A, and then the, and the D that you're talking about up on the upper end, the tension, tension nine way up high. And that way the chord has the same notes, but it just has a more open sound. And when you, again, as I said before, when you open up your chords, then you have more room to go voice leading where one chord resolves the other, trying to keep as many common tones as possible 
and just kind of having them melt into each other instead of jumping around from chord to chord and, and, and going through all the motion. Uh, so anyway, um, okay, we've got one more here. Okay, this 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 will definitely be the last one. He said, "Okay, is it more important to play musically and with good phrasing in solo vibraphone playing rather than playing at the proper tempo the composer has indicated?" So, my wife, being a composer, she's a fanatic about if she comes up with a piece of music at a certain tempo, that's in her brain at that tempo. And when I when she counts it off. It's inevitably always at that tempo. So, yeah, she wants it at that tempo. However, if you can't play it at that tempo, uh, if you're not exactly with the composer who's saying, hey, this is the tempo you got to use, uh, then by all means, I think it's way more important to be musical. You want to be musical all the time. It, music is not technique. Music is not volume. Music is pleasant. It's, it's dissonance resolution. It's, it's making things that, that are orally satisfying. Um, and, and again, it's not about technique. Yes, you want to have technique. You want to have technique so that if there's something that you need, there's a line that you like really want to play that will like be the improvisation that you're like looking for, then you use your technique to get to that line. And if you don't have the technique, obviously you can't play that line. So yeah, you want to have good technique. But again, I think the most important thing in all of this is, is to be musical. So anyway, I just want to thank also the Vibes uh, Project, and this is the 100-year anniversary of the Vibraphone. This is pretty exciting, so we're going to go out of our way to try to make uh, the Vibraphone uh, the next uh, saxophone or whatever, and, and make it successful and accepted in the world uh, that we have right now. Hopefully this COVID thing will be over soon, and we can all get back to listening to music and going to concerts and being involved with the community. I just got my second COVID shot yesterday. Had a bad day today. I mean, I was really like not feeling well, but uh, I'm feeling okay now. So anyway, everybody get your, get your vaccination and let's get over this thing and get back to music. So anyway, thank you, uh, Vibes Project and everybody that tuned in. Uh, had a great time. Uh, this will be up on YouTube later on, so you can go back and refer to it or let your students see it. And, Again, thank you so much, and uh, have a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye.